All right, welcome everybody to the Scrum Power Hour. Tonight's topic is, are you faking the Scrum Funk? And Arlen, I, I didn't see your, your face there, but I know you're here and I want to just call you out because you are the one that gave me this, um, this phrase. And I, I wanna give you credit for it because I continue to use it. And it is something that is very important to me and important to this, the Scrum master role, as well as other agile roles. Um, we're gonna do a little bit of a retrospective today on living the Scrum values. And like I mentioned, we'll be going into breakout rooms in just a little bit, so you can meet each other, talk to each other, and then we'll come back and we'll finish our discussion. So our backlog for tonight, we did a little bit of a welcome and introduction. I don't typically record that, so that's not part of the recording, but we did kind of cover that. I'll introduce myself a little bit. We'll talk about our next event, which is coming up in two weeks. I'll do a little bit of a, a slide presentation and discussion with you folks in a large room on the Scrum Values, and then we'll go into our breakout room and you'll get to meet each other. All right, so who am I? You probably know my name. You, you showed up here. You, you've seen me on LinkedIn. Maybe you've been following me. My name is Patty. I am a, I'm passionate about Scrum. I'm passionate about Agile. Um, I've worked in various industries and various company sizes. Currently, I am the owner of my own company, Agile Mindset Consulting, and I focus on helping scrum masters step into their role. So I do one-on-one -on -one career coaching. I also do scrum simulating, um, helping scrum masters learn what that environment is, especially if they're transitioning into it. So I do some training with them. And I also go into companies and I help them with their agile transformation as well as their, their scrum master skill development. So that's a little bit about me. I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, as I mentioned before we started recording, the cherry blossoms are blooming. Strange because it's February, but I'm enjoying this 60 degree weather. So I thought we'd start off with a quote. I read this in a book two days ago on business agility. But as you know, all books start out, out with a general explanation of agile. So I thought we'd take a look at this quote and then maybe have a little discussion about it because it is directly related to faking the funk. So this um, particular author was talking about the Agile Manifesto in this case, but it applies to the, the Scrum values and the Scrum framework as well. So grand principles that generate no action are mere vapor. Conversely, specific practices in the absence of guiding principles are often inappropriately used. So I thought I'd throw this out to the audience. What does this quote mean? And feel free to just call out. Um, we're, we're a smaller group today, so no problem. Um, I'll say for me, I, um, I feel like that it's saying if you don't have anything um, any ground structure guiding what you're doing, then what you're doing isn't really meaningful. So if whatever you're doing doesn't really have any kind of, um, you know, pillars, if you want to call them pillars or values or structure or principles that's actually guiding your work, then what are you doing essentially? Yeah. But paraphrase it, I'd say the first sentence to me reads as, um, well-written and great theory um, that doesn't actually stimulate you for practice or practical application of that theory is useless. And then conversely, lots of activity and you know lots of goals and lots of tasks that have no structure or guidance or framework uh, will often yield no valuable uh, outcomes. Yes. Yes. Can anybody come up with some examples of these? I mean, let's start with, with the first sentence there. Can you give us an example of where a company or a team or even a person has these great philosophies or great principles, but there's nothing behind it?
they don't walk the uh walk the talk mm -hmm. so i know you you mentioned you were you've been a long time developer where have you seen this on your teams so i can throw my, my sense in here so if you look at the first agile principles about delivering value to the customer that's like the most important thing but then a lot of the value delivered to the customers isn't really what they need because they're really not listening to the customer. So it go it actually goes against that first principle. Um, and this this happens at my organization that I'm in, Patty, and um, you know I've been in many other organizations as well. But they just kind of go back on what they stand on. It's just there for show, right? But it's it's really not no action behind the show. It's 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 kind of like a lamb a nice Lamborghini with no engine. Um, I would say as far as a specific example, something that I just thought about is that you have, because I work in uh, higher education, you have a um, quite a lot of institutions or colleges out there that have certain values like honesty, integrity, um, you know, certain, just certain uh, mission statements, you know, but those schools end up shutting down because they aren't actually um, practicing those values, you know, they're not really enrolling real students. Um, it's all about numbers to them. You know, they're not really, um, you know, they're, um, the accrediting bodies that they're supposed to report to, you know, they aren't really reporting properly, which of course results in them shutting down. So that would be like a direct, um, effect in regards to, um, this particular quote. Yep. I know you're you're in higher education. My first career was middle school education. So a few steps behind on the education train there, but um, the more I think about it, um, the, the education system mirrors so much about what we see in, in companies out there today, especially large complex companies. Exactly. So it, it's identical. So there's a lot of um, spewing of values and mission statements and quotes up on the wall, mm -hmm. but we don't do anything to move towards actually taking action on those things. Um, the second sentence there about practices that are not used ap appropriately because there's no principle behind it. Can anybody think, think of any examples that they've seen in their daily lives, in their work, where this is the case? I think that has to do overall with not just the documentation, like standard operating procedures, if it's a larger company, but more with the whole culture and mindset in the organization where, you know, some ad hoc teams, they're performing certain actions, they're holding certain meetings, having certain cadence, certain lengths having certain stakeholders involved or not involved in other teams possibly replicated, but they don't really have guiding principles, which again, just in my humble approach, um, I see it as they don't have it as a organization centric culture of agile. Um, they look at it sort of from the standpoint, we have an issue or we have a practice inside the team and we use it to the best of our ability, or we have taken it from another department or team or even maybe a company that has been doing it this way and it has been working for them. But the question of why, like Simon Sinek says, that's something in the air that nobody really wants to ask or has time to ask. Yeah. This is where, you know, companies are accused of just doing the framework. They just do the, in some places they still call them ceremonies. They still do, they do the scrum events, they collect the metrics, uh, they use JIRA, but nobody knows why we're doing them. So if we don't know the intent and purpose behind all of these pieces, we may cut some of them out because we don't feel like doing them. They make us uncomfortable or we just do them for the sake of doing them. And then we say we're agile. So there's a lot of faking the funk on both sides of the coin here. And, you know, as scrum masters or agile coaches, or I know there's a lot of different roles that, that show up to this power hour. Um, 
we we need to take a step back if we're going to be leaders in our organization and reflect on are we faking the funk are we spewing a lot of you know evangelistic ideas and there's nothing behind it or are we just doing things for the sake of doing them because the scrum guide says so and i think either way we find ourselves in a little bit of a pickle and these types of reputations precede us so this is where we f focus on um you know, really stepping into our leadership role and living those values. And we're going to talk a little bit about that um, as we move on. You know, the other piece, I don't know if, if some of you are on LinkedIn as, as much as I am, but this this post was just went up, it was probably a few hours ago, um, about the robots taking over our jobs, right? There, there's always this fear that robots are coming for us. The biggest one that everybody's talking about now is chat GBT. So this is an interesting post. It's one of those little carousels that have um, each one of these roles broken down as to no, chat GBT is not taking over our roles. And if you look at this specific answer here, I just chose one of them. You can't relate, you can't replace interaction amongst human beings with chat GPT or with a robot. We are helping people change their behaviors. We are helping them step into new ways of working and a robot cannot lead people down that path. If you look at his answer here, it talks about, you know, facilitating um, and supporting the development process, which includes promoting and evangelizing the principles and values, facilitating teamwork and people communicating and working together and helping teams remove obstacles. And if technology could have <laughs> replaced communication, it would have done it by now, right? We have Microsoft Teams, we have you know all of these chat rooms that we use at work and it just has become much, much more complicated to get that communication flowing. So it's our role to help this process by stepping into the Scrum values. And, you know, taking the focus off of doing the process, but injecting the humanness into our work and helping companies realize that, yeah, if the, if the robots are coming for our jobs, our job is actually to help the humans interact. We're not there to implement a process. So we have to, to look at things in a little bit different of a way. So as I mentioned, I was uh, a teacher in my first career. Uh, we're gonna do a little bit of, of, of teaching here. Um, and again, you could just throw this in the chat. We're gonna do some basic, let's do some knowledge checking. Um, what are the five scrum values? Can we label this diagram if we were in a classroom? So throw it into the chat. What did I cover up here? Respect, openness, commitment, courage, focus. Yep, we got them. Okay, so that was an easy question, right? What do these words actually mean? So if we were to take it a step further, what do you understand this to mean in your organization? Um, I would say that, um, you know, focus is obviously, you know, being able to focus on what you're doing on the product, you're focusing on the work. Um, you know, openness is just having the ability to be open about the challenges that we face in the work setting and being able to, of course, respect each other as we're going through that process and just having the courage to do what's right and being committed to those changes. Yeah. Anything else? Anybody want to add to that? Specifically for courage, Patty? Anyone, throw it out. I think for courage, for me, that's probably the most important one in agility, because 
it's oftentimes, and I've had numerous sessions with my co-peers in this field, um, they walk a thin line, right? We're sort of like agile Jedis. Uh, we know it's the right thing, and we don't think about the money or anything like that, but it's kind of, we think about the implications, what's going to happen if we raise our voice, talk to stakeholders, or talk about a problem, uh, reveal the dependencies, right? Or sort of ring the bell and let everybody know because we care and because we want to rectify the issue, but that will actually put us on the spot and, you know, that'll be the end of our, let's say, career there. And I actually have gone through that kind of a situation myself and I have suffered um, surprisingly, but that's just me personally. It has, has, hasn't has made me shut my mouth. It has made me to be more profound about it and turn it into workforce and labor rights movement in a way, an equity movement in the agile transformation process. But I think the reason it's number one is because if you don't have courage to embark on the journey of true agile transformation, whether you're scrum master, whether you're a developer, whether you're a product owner, or whether you're just a agile team member in some capacity, there's no reason to shout out loud that, yeah, agile, we practice agile, I'm agile or I'm certified in agile. It takes lots of guts to truly practice this the same way it probably takes to practice any faith that we would practice. Just my perspective. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree with what uh, Audrey just said, because I actually came across a similar situation with me too, where I actually raised my voice for um, something to make changes, but, you know, it kind of, when it comes down from uh, above where you have certain management people um, uh, making those decisions, but looking for you to uh, make those changes and bring some change into processes or things of that nature. Um, a lot of the time, it, it, it doesn't come to the fruitful situation that we are looking to make the change in. So from that perspective, I feel that it's a bit of a, you know, setback. Yeah, it is, it is difficult. I, I just wanted to talk about um, respect and openness. Um, respect, what it looks like for me, is just, you know, um, being an active listener. I've always been told that you earn respect with your ears, but you can lose it with your mouth. So making sure that we are mindful of the things that we say and how we treat people. Uh, but if you want to be a respect, you have to listen to people. You have to hear them out and not always have something to say. Um, openness, I look at openness as, you know, think just being open to others' perspectives uh, or their suggestions because we're not all the same. We think differently. And um, what I think of, and I was going to post it on uh, link, LinkedIn later on this evening. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the, uh, with the graphic where you have a six or someone may say that it's a nine, depending on which end of the number. So from my perspective, it's a six. But if you're on the other end of the spectrum, it's a nine, right? So we want to make sure that we are... Um, being open to others, um, whether it's a different culture, just being there to um, listen to them. One of the things that <clears throat> I've been able to understand, because one of the things that Stephen Covey said is that we want to make sure that we seek for understanding and not to be understood. So not always coming at things from a particular angle, just always be open and then respectful to others. I loved what you. you said about, no, I just, I loved what you said about, you know, the, the, can, can you repeat it again? Because the words are now slipping out of my, my brain about the, the ears and the mouth. Oh, no problem. I was saying that you earn respect with your ears, but you lose it with your mouth. So that goes back to just being an active listener, because sometimes we, you know, we say things that's mean we say things that's hurtful and we sometimes we say things and it's not about what we said but it's the tone in which you use so 
you earn more respect just by listening because through listening you you gain a better understanding yes yeah this this stuff is tough i will say um you know over the years i've become a much stronger person because I just have had to be because, you know, you're, you're facing so many challenges and it takes a lot of courage sometimes to sh show somebody, you know, what's not going well and they don't want to look. Um, but it's almost like if we don't do this, who will? So that's kind of the fine line that we walk. And like I said, I've, I've become so much stronger of a person but it is through listening to other people and trying to put myself in their shoes and understand if they're upset or overwhelmed or they make a certain decision or they say something that I try to understand where they're coming from and not take it personally and that's been a huge journey for me um, especially when it comes to posting on LinkedIn because when as you all know, you know, you look through the comment section and sometimes people make a comment that you take negatively and maybe they didn't mean it that way. So I always try to listen and ask questions and make, make sure I didn't misunderstand and then react from a place of emotion. So it's tough. <laughs> it's tough. <laughs> so I, I put this little note here to remind myself. So let me put up a little poll and if I can get to it. Here we go. Just to see what everybody's thinking about these. So which value is your strongest? And which do you think needs the most improvement? All right, so which value is your strongest? We have 50% respect, 40% commitment, 10% courage. Looks like we don't have any takers for focus or openness. Okay, this makes sense because we all bring different things to the table. We all have our own strengths and our, our own root, you know, places that we can continuously improve. We all have different life experiences and we have all, you know, we're all on a different journey. So if you look at, which needs the most improvement, same thing. You know, it looks like a lot of people voted for courage, 60%. Because again, this, this, is, this is tough. A lot of times, you know, when we're faced with something different, especially as we're pushing ourselves even further and further out of our comfort zone, we might feel like we can't do it. We don't have the strength to do it. We might, I always say run and hide under the bed because I'm right next to my bed. Um, you know, and sometimes I, I do feel that way, but I always remind myself too, you know, if I don't do this, how is it possible that I can ask or even expect the people in front of me to do it? All right. So I'm going to put you into small breakout rooms. Um, I will put this slide, um, as a link as a Google Doc in the chat, so you can refer to it once you go into your group and you you lose my screen here. But we're gonna put you in groups of like three or four. Of course, introduce yourself, you know, your name and where you're from. And then, you know, you see how much time you have, whether you can discuss all of them or if you wanna choose one of them or a few of them, but discuss what it looks like to exhibit these values well in your teams. So maybe give some real life examples where courage is needed on your teams. Maybe they constantly have a fire hose of work on them and somebody needs to talk to the, the person that's you know aiming that fire hose and say, this is not working for us. How can we make this better? Um, but what I really want you all to dig into is how can you show courage to exhibit courage to your team to let them know that it's okay to, to, to I guess stand on the edge of the cliff. Tracy, if you're still here, you know what I'm talking about. Stand on the edge of the cliff there and, and take a jump 
and you can survive the jump um, because sometimes it does feel like leaping off a, a cliff to stretch yourself out of your comfort zone. So how can you show up and demonstrate courage and let your team members see you so they can have the courage to do it as well. So I'm gonna stop sharing. I will put this as a link in the chat. So let me just grab that for you. And then I will put it in, I put you in breakout rooms and then we will have probably about 15 minutes. Coffee link. Well, welcome back everybody. Um, I hope you had some great conversation. Um, in the last 10 minutes, what we usually do is a group share out. So every group uh, takes a turn speaking to the large group here and, and tell us a little bit about the conversation. So not only does that give everybody kind of some additional insight into kind of what some of the other conversations were, but it also gives you a, an opportunity to speak in front of a large group if that's something you'd like to practice. I always encourage that. So with that being said, who would like to go first? I don't like awkward silence, so I'll go first. Um, <laughs> Um, it was really nice to speak to other people who were also in the higher education, um, you know, sector and just kind of have someone else to understand, you know, what it's like just working in that field and practicing certain values. Um, one of the things that I did mention when we were talking about, um, you know, what we struggle with the most is, um, openness. And, you know, when you're working on a team and, you know, someone maybe isn't performing to the best of their abilities or, you know, there's a, a, cha a challenge or something going on um, with that team member being open about that, but you have to be able to be open in the right way um, so that that person is not offended or taken back. And, you know, it's, you can still come in, of course, with that respect and the courage to do so, um, but it's how you're open about that situation. Um you know, so I was, the way that I was kind of explaining uh, things is that I kind of have a different approach when it comes to being open, um, you know, about challenges is personally, I try to let the other people, other person um, see where they need to, to grow. And I actually don't really say anything. I just kind of show them the, I let them come to their own kind of conclusion on things. But, um, but yeah, that was one of the, um, one of the ones that we did mention, but um, we were just talking about how you can also, you know, use these values and apply them everywhere and how a lot of different relationships and teams and um, even if you're not working, even if you're, you know, family, whatever, I mean, if everyone practiced these values, um, you know, life will just be a lot better for, uh, for everyone in a sense. So yeah, thank that's you. all I have to say about the matter. <laughs> All right. Who else was in your group? Was it? I was. And? Yeah. Okay. Did you want to add um, anything to that? No, uh, I think, yeah, that that's what uh, I'm not a practicing scrum master, probably won't be, but um, I wanted to learn more about it, got the certification and I just, I love it um, because I really think that it's something that everybody should learn because no matter where you are in the team, you still need all of this. Um, it, it just allows you to grow as people and to be, um, you know, accepting of many different voices out there. It's one of the, one of the keys to a scrum team or any team is, is collaboration. And <laughs> speaking to my, my former teachers or teachers, um, we're not really taught true collaboration in school. You're put, you're like, you put kids in, in groups to do group work and maybe they interact and they, they talk, but it's not, it's not the same thing that we're expecting of our, our teams here. So in a lot of ways, we haven't been trained to do these things. Yes. And Trin, that's a great point. Um, you don't need to be a scrum master. Let me see if I can read your full comment here. Um, yeah, you don't need to be a scrum master and agile coach to live by these values and, and, and lead others, um, towards them as well. Super. All right. Next group. I don't know what group you were, but we have three other groups. 
Well, in our group, we talked about uh, also the values of uh, courage and uh, respect and openness too. Um, and uh, uh, we, we came uh, to the, the conclusion that, for example, uh, courage seemed to be a bit hard for um, teams and for individuals, but uh, in the end, it boils down to uh, um, to being tr uh, truthful to yourself, to your values, and if agility is about being flexible and uh, collaborative, it's important to not make compromise compromise on values and uh, on uh, uh, what we find acceptable work environment and what is not acceptable work environment, not just for yourself, but for also the team and the other teams. <clears throat> if you think about I'm it- I'm always so... muted. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead, Andre. <laughs> No, I was just going to say, uh, if you think about it, the word company in general means, you know, company of friends, company of people. So company in general gives you an idea that people alike, people that like each other, people that want to find value out of being there together, spending their time. So it's whatever we create. It's the worst thing ever, in my humble opinion and experience, when you come into a company and uh, you didn't have, let's say, enough research or ability to understand the culture. And they're telling you, you have to do this this way, you have to do that this way. You, uh, It's one thing when they're trying to mentor you to do your job better, when it's really helpful and you're growing that way. But it's another story where you have to sort of, you know, in Rome, you know, eat spaghetti, right? And sort of like that drink espresso. But what if you don't like espresso? What if it's too strong for you, but you still like coffee, right? So kind of like your individuality, your ability to um, be courageous enough to voice that and the ability of the organization to be mature enough to transcend the borderline between we're paying them money and this is what we need them to do as a commodity as opposed to saying, listen, we treat you as a human. Yes, we're paying you money, but that's a formality and you're definitely worth all the money we pay you, but we want you to feel comfortable here because it's your second home and we don't want you to look for another job, right? We want you to be here and form this company together with us so we're a company of great people, quality as opposed to quantity, right? So the reason I mentioned all this is because it kind of, um, what was mentioned that these values really, it's not about agile, it's about so many cultures, so many religions, like something I look into more or less from a philosophical perspective on a regular basis is Buddhism. It's just like so much there. And these people like that invented that they were like years and years and decades and generations before. And all of these great truths they're written and you're reading like, are these guys, are they certified in natural? Or like, <laughs> how did they know all this stuff? Because it's common truth, right? It's philosophical thought, you know, Greek philosophy and all of that. It's just people have forgotten that or don't like reading these days. And then they get, let's say, certified or start working on agile projects or coming across scrutiny in the workplace. And they're like, yeah, it doesn't make sense. Why isn't this this way? Oh, hold on. It is this way. It actually was written many centuries before Leonardo da Vinci talked about it. Other great people like Goethe talked about it, but we didn't want to listen. We didn't want to read. We didn't even know who these people were until... You know, we visited Louvre or France or something like that. So maybe I'm going too deep into it, but what I'm saying is all of the known truth, we pretty much know what they are. And the um, Scrum values and Agile Manifesto, they draw on the best things that all of the generations of knowledge have produced for us to take and employ in our daily technical project management and other work-related processes. Yeah. That's an important point because it, these are kind of universal human truths. That's why it's almost like we keep coming back to them. And I think as humans, we think with all these technological advances, we we know more. Um, those people way back then, they, they really don't know anything because they were from centuries ago or millennia ago. But they were also humans. And human behavior is human behavior. So I, I get what you're saying. Um, thanks for sharing that. Any other groups want to, oh, we are just about at time. We are over time. Um, any other groups want to share what they were discussing amongst themselves with the larger group here? I do have a quick question. Um, I, oh gosh, I can't remember her name. I'm sorry. Um, but uh, I know someone was mentioning that you, you do these often. 
Um, is there like some kind of schedule or do you just kind of place it on LinkedIn whenever? Or? That is a great question. And I, I did want to make sure I met, mentioned that. So thank you for, for asking. Um, so this is a biweekly Scrum Power Hour meetup. In two weeks, we're going to have a guest and I like to do what I call a fireside chat. So we just do like a personal conversation. It's kind of interview style. Um, some of you have been here for some of them, but I bring in people that I feel like they've they've obviously contributed to the Scrum and Agile community, but they they also have a very interesting story to tell. They have a journey that they want to share to um, you, you know help all everybody out in the community. Um, make, make progress on their journey too. So we will have somebody coming in two weeks. Her name is Deepali Negrani. And some of you may know her from LinkedIn. She's also very active in the, the posting community. Um, but she's going to talk to us about her journey from moving from India to Canada. And, you know, the, obviously the, the cultural change, but also how did she land a scrum master not being a Canadian citizen? Um, so how, what, what, what has her, her job and career journey been um, to, to get her where she is now? So that will be coming out um, as an Eventbrite invite, probably within the next, I would say, week or so. So look for it. And if you're a part of the LinkedIn group, group it's called Scrum Power Hour. I always post in there when they're coming up too as well. So um, I will see everybody in two weeks and feel free to connect on LinkedIn. Um, you can put your link in the chat if you'd like and I will see you then. Thank oh, you so much, Pat. Did, did, you, did yeah. you mention, sorry? Oh, did you have a question? I said, what was the name you mentioned? Uh, sorry, the, the lady who's coming. Uh, Deepali Nagrani. Oh, deep oh, okay, okay, okay. All right. Thank you. And, and and I put the group uh, link, uh, Patty, for everyone of your Thank group. You. I just submitted a request to join as well. Thank you so much. It was very informative and great discussion. And look forward to many other ones. Okay. Have a great evening, everybody. Enjoy your dinners, and we'll sure. see you in a couple of weeks. Bye. -bye.